Well, today we are thrilled to introduce to the Bite Size Podcast a dynamic guest with a flair for visual storytelling, Denver Bailey. From the heart of major television productions to pioneering digital networks, Denver has a robust experience in video production. And beyond your professional prowess, I understand your passion really lies in the entire video creation process from ideation to the final cut. So Denver, it's great to have you on our podcast. I know our FMO Media audience will no doubt be excited to hear this full episode, um, especially your unique insights in the world of video production and how you've grown in your career from um, not just being in the production as a, a valuable team member, but building your own business and helping other business owners really build their brand online too. So um, let's kick it off. Today, we wanna dive a little bit deeper into that journey and um, get to hear you know, what it was like starting in your early days of television all the way till up until now and owning and running your own business. So dive in, let's get started. What, uh, what do you like to talk about as your sort of trajectory into the world of video and production? Th that was quite the intro. Wow, you have... <laughs> I feel like you've done some research. Um, a little. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like to just tell people that I started my business and joined the media in 20, 2016. Uh, it's seen multiple phases throughout 2016 to where we are now. I, I, I guess I feel like we're almost at like phase three now Ooh. as far as like the phases we've been in. It's It changes every couple of years of like, what it's become. Uh, I'm very happy with where it is right now. Uh, prior to that, I was working in film and television. Uh, I like to say that I got out probably just in time because I have a lot of friends that are gainfully unemployed. Um, so yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. That's a really good summary. I'm curious, uh, what was the spark for you that that introduced you to the world of production or that moment where you knew, oh my gosh, this is my career that I want to begin. What was that moment for you? Oh, that was very, very early on. I picked up a camera. I don't know. I was maybe 10. I know I got my first personal like proper camcorder when I was 14. Oh, wow. And I, 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 I worked really hard to save up the money to purchase that. And it was a Sony Handycam. I still have it. Um, so I, I mean, I've been making videos forever. Do you remember the first thing you recorded on that Sony? I don't necessarily remember the first thing I recorded on that particular camera, but I, I do have like vivid memories of myself as a, as a child, essentially directing my brother in the backyard to like, oh my goodness. <laughs> like climb a ladder in a certain way while I captured a low angle to make it look like he was climbing super high. So I, I do have vivid memories of this as far as like the first thing I recorded with that particular camera. I, I don't know. I was just making, you know, silly things to post on YouTube at that point. I feel like that's a great way to get started though. You you practice and you have fun and you experiment and then you see what works for you and what your style is. Is that something that you would agree with, disagree with? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. It's all about experimenting, <laughs> finding what you like to do. Uh, I would say that's even true now as like a I guess a, a veteran business owner, I guess it's, you still kind of like find new things that you like and kind of like that spark and, you know, venture into different things. Very Definitely. Cool. And so like even starting that early, right. And then kind of, uh, to where you are now doing it professionally, um, what would you say are, and I'm sure you probably identified them at the, at this point, but what would you say when you're putting together that video, you know, what are the the key elements of, of storytelling or good storytelling, so to speak? I would say this is true no matter you're making a long form piece of content, a movie, a short vertical video for the internet, no matter what, I, I think everything's going to have the same parts of the story. You want to hook the audience in some way. And, and when that comes to like a movie, I talk about this a lot, that can be something that's 15 minutes long. But for us and a lot of the content we're creating, we're trying to hook people with like that first frame of video or the first second. And then you want to deliver 
on what you're hooking them with. So telling that story beginning to end, but not trying to trick people into watching your video is something that we're we're looking at. So, I mean, if you can tell a bedtime story, you can make a great video. Um, but yeah, beginning, that's middle, end. About it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's a really good way that beginning is really crucial too. Have you been tracking or following the, the sort of time that you do have to grab people's attention in video format? That's something that has been important for us. And as we've seen the length of videos decrease or even increase across some of the platforms as they hold longer short form video. Is that something that you've been noticing and tracking yourself? Uh, I, not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I know that's, that's, it's kind of terrible. Um, for us, like for a lot of the clients that we're working with, we create the videos and then we hand those off. We're not actually, managing any content. So when it comes to the metric side, it's nice for like case studies when clients share those metrics with us and let us know. For example, like one of our newer clients sent us metrics recently on his first two weeks of content. He gained over 4,000 followers on a single video. You know, he got over a million impressions. Like, so like when we see this type of like metrics it's nice not necessarily what i'm fixated on seeing because i feel like we we've got a pretty good uh grasp of what makes a good video and there's only so much we can do like we can we can make that good video and then put it out there oh yeah that's a good way of thinking about it there you, there are limitations but it seems like with your video content you are able to pull out as much of the storytelling from your subjects, from your clients as possible too. Did it take um, your background in film and television or your own unique style of production to help get to that point with your subjects? I'm making the assumption you're, you're, you're speaking specifically to like our, our short vertical interview style videos. Yeah. Um, so with that, with that type of content that goes back much farther than like just making these short form vertical pieces. I would say in college, I got an opportunity and this was a long time ago. I got an opportunity to make some short documentary pieces with like students on campus that were doing things above and beyond. I, I don't exactly remember what the premise was, but <laughs> Even making that type of content was very similar still to like what we do now in, in that space and learning to talk to a subject and extract good stories, I think is a, is a key thing that I've learned even from, from that point to now. That's a, a great way of thinking about it too, because I imagine the amount of prep that goes into preparing a singular client versus a full production for maybe a commercial or mm -hmm. a television show. Yes, there's a lot involved there too, but you probably have to put a lot of effort into that prep with that sole person on camera. If they're the one that's ultimately carrying the energy and the subject matter and bringing the authenticity to it at the same time too. Do you feel like that's sort of accurate or, um, how, I guess the question around that is, you know, how do you prepare someone to be the sole subject in a video mm -hmm. um, when it is kind of reliant on their knowledge and know-how at the same time, too? Yeah, I, you know, it's great that you say that because a lot of the clients we work with, they like to go around and say that there's zero prep involved in this. And there's a lot more prep involved than like maybe on their part, there's not a lot of prep, but. On, on my side, like when I sit down and talk to someone about their business, I need to like, I need to know something about their business in order to have a conversation with them. Because if you're sitting there asking questions and looking down at a paper and then like they answer it and then you look at the paper and look up, like, like if you're doing this back and forth, you can feel that kind of tension created in the room when you're, you're treating this like a back and forth 
thing. My goal is to make it as fluid as possible so that they are comfortable on camera. Like I don't even want it to feel like that we're filming something. So it, it's it's almost like a very lengthy podcast, what I'm what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. The irony. Well, yeah, yeah too, because at the same time people are seeing it's it's the lenses are, are just so interesting because you're filming them through one lens, right? And then somebody else is viewing them through another and it has to feel almost like they're in person to keep them engaged, to keep people that are on their social media essentially engaged, you know, talking about specifically uh, short form content, but um, that's what ends up happening is that you have to have it feel natural because people can tell, right? You can tell mm -hmm. if it's scripted, not, and you mentioned that tension, it'll definitely get in the way. Um, I know one thing that, you know, even with short form content or long form content, you know, uh, there's a big role that sound and background music will play um, in terms of like enhancing a story. So what are your thoughts on that? What role does sound design and, and background music really play in enhancing a story that someone's trying yeah. to tell, even if it is shorter? It's a huge thing for us. Like, I, I like to think that when it comes to the short form content that we're scoring the videos as opposed to just like slapping a, a song on there, like it's something that we focus on a lot to make sure that the music is matching the story that's being told so that we can kind of influence the emotions of the person watching. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what a movie is, right? It's like when you're moved by something. Uh, so that's, that's really our goal. Um, and then when it comes to like sound design, uh, we use all types of sound effects to accent the, the story, be that like cinematic impacts or uh, desk bell dings. Like we, we do all kinds of stuff. <laughs> now, now all that said, what we don't do is add like sound effects every time something happens on camera, every time there's a title or something like that. Uh, when I see things like that, I think it's kind of distracting. So that's mm -hmm. like, I, I want to ensure that across all of our videos, the sound effects is accenting what we're doing, not being like a deterrent from someone, someone being able to focus on the video. I think uh, there was, there was like a moment of time where people felt like they needed that in order to make people pay attention. But the truth is, is if you're telling a good story, people are going to listen no matter what. I like that you said that because we've heard from folks um, sort of in the creator space that people don't really have short attention spans because we can all binge watch on Netflix. Exactly. But we actually talk about one of our other episodes as well, too. But people have the ability to binge watch. We have the ability to scroll on our phone and absorb an enormous amount of content but we're only going to do that if it's engaging and giving mm -hmm. value to us and so a lot of the short form content that i've seen you create and your clients put out there in their own spaces is valuable stories that either entertain us or make us stop and think or educate us in some way um so mm -hmm. i love that you point that out you want to accent what it is they're talking about, not overwhelm somebody just to grab their attention. Because at the end of the day, if it's not a valuable piece of content, then it doesn't matter if you grab their attention or not, they're going to move on if it doesn't serve them. Correct. Yeah. You just, you just cannot, you have to have some belief that the people watching the videos are like somewhat intelligent enough to know that like, it's, it's a good piece of content. Like, like you can't just assume that short attention spans are the reason why you're not getting people to stick around mm -hmm. on your video. That's a, that's a big, uh, you can't assume that short attention spans, like you might have to rethink your content. Right. Um, people, people want to, they want to use that as like a scapegoat for like why their video is not doing well. Perhaps your video sucks. So <laughs> right. you gotta accept the truth, right? The, the yeah. people will tell you what they want or what they don't want. So right. that's, that's huge. Um, I know I've had to face that sometimes where I'm like, oh, maybe that just wasn't a good video. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next. That's crazy. Yeah. One of the things too is because you're also interviewing or um, having the conversations with uh, 
you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, business owners, um, and they want to represent their brand. And, you know, gone are the days of the billboard of call me, you know, if (laughs) 1-800-555. So like, I think one of the biggest things on social media right now, or with any type of short form content, and actually, if I think about it, what you said about movies and how people are being moved, um, it is authenticity, right? And making sure that like, the feeling is authentic or the storytelling is authentic. So how do you help ensure that that authenticity shines through in that video? Um, especially in today's content where like you, you do have polished video content, right? It's edited. Mm-hmm. Um, we try and take the bloopers away, the ums, the ahs, et cetera. And so how, how does that authenticity come out or how do you, train or coach some of your um, clients through that as well. I think a big part of that is that when we're working with these entrepreneurs, if you will, that the content's not scripted. So like you can only hide so much when like you're just answering a question. So if it's not like you can refine the script over and over again to, to say the right thing. So (laughs) If, if if someone just asks you a question and you give the answer, then that's more than likely your honest answer. So, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's the, the key right there. Number one, don't, don't use, it's not a movie script. It's, uh, but I'm not, I'm not a hater of billboards, by the way. Oh, I, no. <laughs> I, 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 I have a big stance on this because like, <laughs> Like if someone was to offer me a free billboard out on 85 right now with my name on it, I'd, yeah, I'd take that all day. But like, I think at the end of the day, we are doing the same thing, but differently. Well, I'll say there's probably enough traffic in Atlanta for someone to actually stare at the billboard That's for correct. a long time for it to make an impact. So mm-hmm. I get it. I'm into yeah. it. That is a, a refreshing point of view, too, because they are doing different things and it is important to stay top of mind across the board um, for everybody, you know, whether it is in person or, you know, when people are out and about or um, in the digital space. So you're not you're definitely not wrong. I think it's a, a great point of view. I think from our point of view and as marketers, it comes down to the metrics and how do we show what's working and so the digital content's a lot easier to show than the billboard and the roi of a billboard mm-hmm. but ultimately the the goals are all the same to stay for first and foremost front and center top of mind um for everybody who might potentially see you and really build that awareness is what, there are there digital billboards on i-85 at all yeah yeah there's a lot of digital yeah. billboards okay. I'm but it, it, here here's we can get off billboards but i'll say one <laughs> thing about board, billboards really quick i think the billboard only works if you have the billboards everywhere so like as long as your face is everywhere then it's like like if you if you you see john morgan morgan and morgan the 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 attorney yeah even though he's not the real lawyer but like you <laughs> you see him all over the place okay so obviously there's brand recognition there when it comes to video if you're able to make enough videos and continually put them out that you're showing up everywhere for people then it's kind of the same thing it's it's that brand recognition definitely i 100 percent agree with that it's you're gonna um here in i'm in florida and uh there's a okay last thing about billboards i promise (laughs) there's one that says it says your wife is hot and it's Sick. about fixing ACs. Yeah. And I'm like, that is some of the most brilliant marketing or advertising I've seen. I thought that was hilarious. And That's I great. see it every time. It's the yellow background with the same woman, et cetera. So yeah, brand mm-hmm. recognition, 100%. So pivoting a little bit from all your experience, your point of view, and I'm sure you have you know, some team members or different people that you've worked with. Um, if anyone's listening that's uh, a videographer or kind of in that space, even an editor, you know, um, I would say what what tips and tricks would you give uh, maybe a rising videographer or someone that's been around for a while, but maybe just has a certain style um, on how to keep a subject 
energized without rushing them when filming. And again, I know a lot of it has to do with probably the conversation that you're trying to have, but do you have a couple like go-to questions or go-to tips that is you're, you're probably working with a couple different personalities and not mm-hmm. everyone's super outgoing and not everyone's super reserved. So how do you balance that? What, tri- uh, what tips do you have for them? When people are reserved, like in some scenarios, like I just don't work with people. <laughs> like, yeah. like I just don't, like, like, if you want to be the best and you want to make the best videos, you can't, you can't work with everybody because yeah. not like, to be frank, not everyone is good on video. So like, you got to be selective. There's like a meme where it's like, is that a good photo or is it just a pretty woman or something? Like, <laughs> like, like it's not necessarily always a good photo. So wow. like, and you see this trend a lot in like Facebook groups for cameras, like people sharing photos and they're not necessarily good photos. It's just like, it's an attractive it person. Good so, or... Right. Yeah. So like, if you want to make good stuff, you need this combination of like having good people in front of the camera and then us behind the camera. So yeah, yeah it's like, it's a recipe. And like, like if you, and we've, we've had, clients before that necessarily you know they're not a good fit and i i'm the first one to just be like hey like it's not gonna work so setting the expectations it makes sense it's like if you're not going to do x y and z you can't expect these results because you're not putting or yeah putting this work in essentially because it's going to be work for no matter who is Uh doing it yeah and and then when you do have that right person like the kind of the second part of that equation there is I, I think you have to be curious about the person you're working with like you got to be genuinely interested in like what they're going to talk about. Like, like we sat down the other day with like this mortgage lender and it's like, I could, I could not be interested in what he's talking about. Cause like, <laughs> But like, we find, we find things to talk about, you know, so like, just be genuinely interested in, and then you can see their eyes light up when you drop some knowledge that they don't expect a non mortgage person to know. So like, if you've done your research and you show that you're interested, like it it makes that, that the, the authenticity come out too. It's almost like you're building a rapport with them at the same time too, Mm -hmm. because you are guiding them and hearkening back to what you were saying about getting started with that documentary style, asking questions. I imagine having a connection across the camera is really important. So I love how you describe that. It's like finding that crack into the storytelling that lets them open up and expand on that. What advice would you then have for like videographers that are starting to develop their own unique voice or maybe their style and storytelling, right? You, you kind of develop this style and you know who at this point you're like, okay, this is going to work out and we're going to do really great things together. Or again, it's not the right fit. Um, I know some up and coming videographers will kind of take on anything at some Mm -hmm. point in their career to maybe challenge themselves or maybe because they need to. Um, Yeah. I think, I think that's, you definitely have to do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely part of starting out is taking everybody and then kind of figuring out what works. You for will you you. Fi- you figure out what doesn't work for you. Like, I mean, I can. I I have a client in my head that I know when I I took on that client, it was a mistake, and like, uh, so I said I said yes to a client for a stupid amount of money, uh, and it kind of like was to the detriment of my business for like six months. Like you, you learn through those mistakes of taking on every client. Like you figure out, like, I don't want to do that type of thing, or I don't want to work with that type of client. Well, that being said, how about your favorite client or your favorite project that you've Hmm. ever worked on? What do you have that you would like? Maybe it's lately or maybe ever. That's a good question. Um, favorite project. So like about 50% of our 
business is making product commercials for children's toys. So to be honest, like that as a whole is one of my, my favorite things. I know we haven't really talked about that, but yeah. Uh, but that, about it. Yeah. So we work, we work with, you know, different, different toy companies uh, to make product videos. Like, like for example, like what you could see as an ad on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube. And then like, if you're shopping on target and like scrolling through the images and you see a video, stuff like that. Right. Um, so that's something that like, uh, over the next year, I want to, you know, amass right. more clients there, um, <laughs> and diversify and try to, you know, make an imprint on the toy industry, I guess. That's really, yeah. you get to be like a big kid. Like, you're like no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like we, we have a video that we're working on finishing up right now, which is for, uh, jazz wares and then it's for their adopt me toy line which is like part of roblox but it's not okay. roblox so that's kind of like what's being worked on right now amongst many other things but commercial really? side that's like what we're working on the prep for those must be so much fun <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it can get kind of crazy because the timelines tend to be you know pretty quick and then uh you know there's a lot of lot more moving pieces to something like that as opposed to like your typical entrepreneur or business professional client. How much involvement do you have in the process of that? Are you helping craft the script and the narrative for the the toy commercial itself? Or do you have to rely on somebody else's script and casting? Um, how much sort of oversight and role do you play in that? Typically there is, there's like some must like mandatory, mandatory things that like have to be done. Like you need to show this, you need to do this, but then I, I will write a script, do storyboards, do all that stuff. And then, uh, then they approve it or deny it and make changes. And then, yeah. And when it comes to like casting, we typically work with like a casting agent to find talent and then, you know, send off submissions after sifting through like, you know, countless auditions and then get approval from the client for those. That's really cool. What has been, when it comes to like your favorite project, so if it's toy commercials, product commercials, what's been the least favorite project or it doesn't maybe have to be project, but maybe it's a role that you had on a film crew or set that you were like, oh, not for me, never do again. I mean, definitely like my first day on set. <laughs> like, <laughs> Uh, so my, my first day on set, obviously I was a production assistant. Uh, I was working on a TV show called criminal minds and, uh, it was like past a 15 hour day. Like it was a very long day and I was standing pretty much the whole time. And I was like, you know what? Like, I don't think I want to do this. Yeah. I mean, I continued to do television shows for a, a while. Um, but I definitely knew I didn't want to be a production assistant. So. <laughs> they do have very long days. That sounds like ex yeah. excruciating. Yeah. Um, has there been a moment where you got the shot? I, I always hear from our videographers and my videographer friends, like they get the shot. It's the shot. Mm. And they didn't know that it was happening, but they were recording when it happened and they locked out. Has that happened to you where you just happened to be recording at the right time in the right place? Yeah. I mean, that certainly happened. Um, when you ask a question like that, it doesn't make me think of the kind of stuff that we make now. So mm -hmm. when it comes to the, the scripted stuff, everything is planned out. Everything is storyboarded. Like we're going to get the shot. Like it's all there is to it. Uh, yeah. Cause you won't move on until you got it. When it comes to the interview stuff, like, I mean, there's, there's only so many different ways you can shoot this stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel here. Prior to doing commercial stuff, I did weddings. And in that, in that situation, there was many times where I felt like, man, I just, I got that shot, you know, like, because it was, it was a thing where like, it only happened once. They would only kiss one time. They would only, you know, depart one time. So like there was, 
I would say more than one occasion where I felt like I got that shot. So yeah, but that that's going back a long time. So I can't say for like, like a specific example, but I do remember the feeling. What about feel like- a lot of pressure too on the way? Yeah. Like, there's only one reaction when she's coming down the aisle. A- exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when you, when you mention that, that's probably one I can think of. Yeah. Makes sense too. Has there ever been a time when you're recording, you know, something, a project you're working on now, whether it's a you know, full set commercial product or with an individual and you're like, ah, oh, that would have been really good. I wish I was recording or a big lesson you learn from a project like that so that you have smoother sailing or you kind of have that formula set because you learned that big lesson at the time. I definitely think there's things that I've learned like with the, the toy filming specifically, like there's like, you have to position your toys in a certain way when you're capturing them and you have to film them from certain angles and then they can't move. And like, and if they're small figures, they, they need to stay. And so in most situations we have like a a set person to like handle that stuff. Um, but there's been times where like we didn't have that person, perhaps the, the, the learning thing here is to always hire the right people, but there's been situations (laughs) where like we didn't have the right people and like, uh, using like a form of like sticky to keep a thing to stay in the right place and then filming and then you know, being done with the day and then realizing that like you could still see the sticky stuff on the bottom of the figure and then having to erase that in post. That's like a a thing, like I'll never let that happen again. I'll always make sure (laughs) that like we don't see that. Um, Yeah. I never would have thought about that. But now that you say it, I'm thinking of all the toy commercials or any kind of product commercial where the item has to be either moving or stationary. And how do you control that when you can't just, <laughs> you can't just hold it down? So, right. There's, yeah, there's so many situations where like you, you need it to stay in a specific spot. Do you have to be really good at stop motion or how do you, you know, Barbie, obviously really big topic for everybody still with the movie <laughs> recently now out and people have been playing with Barbies for decades now we all know how they move and how do you move a toy like that in a commercial if you don't have someone manipulating it or how do you um sort of show it off at its best moment when you are trying to eliminate the fact that there is a there's somebody guiding that (laughs) you know we don't do any stop motion uh if you're interested in that, you should you should check out Mason Drum. He he owns a stop motion animation company in Oklahoma called Loud Cloud Creative, I think. Um, so you should ch- check them out. But uh, when it comes to like what we're doing, there's usually a hand involved uh, with moving the figure. So yeah, but there are th- strangely enough, there's ways that you're s- required to hold it. Like you can't hold it. I don't have any figures here, but like, you can't like hold it. You can't hold it from the head because you know, you can't do that. So there's like all these like best practices and rules for like how you're supposed to hold the toys. Um, Now I'm going to dive into more of that content of yours. And obviously, you know, we took a look, I, we follow a lot of your um, content that's more geared towards businesses, entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. that we're kind of into, but I'm I'm so interested in seeing the creative process uh, behind mm-hmm. that too. Do you um, post any like behind the scenes of when you're creating that stuff, or not really? Because it's the client doesn't mm-hmm. really want you to show it. You know, we don't, and yeah. it's something that like like I've almost considered like having like a person. Uh, on staff that like their job is to like film behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Um, but I don't have that person. 
And uh, so set up your phone and do a little time lapse or something. It's, I, that's what I'm interested in. I, I love yeah. seeing that stuff, like what goes into that final product. But um, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely I it's something that I, I want to to do. Like I wanna show more of that. Like even just more of like the day to day stuff. But I feel like I'm and I try, I try to be active in posting myself. I try to make videos. Mm-hmm. It's so hard. And like, <laughs> like, I mean, I like, I'm making so much other content for other people and businesses and like, yeah. And it's not just me. And then like, I have employees and I have to watch their videos and I have to give notes on their videos. And it's like, it's, it's a lot. So like then to think that I'm going to make more videos on top of that, like, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Yeah, <laughs> You're preaching to the choir here. That's definitely yeah. one of the biggest things in our um, industry, I'd say probably as a whole, right? It's like we're, we're telling people what they have to do and then we're like, oh yeah, we got to do it too. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it's like, like you feel like if you're going to be the person telling people they need to make videos, well then you should probably be making videos yourself. So like over the course of August, I put out, I put out more videos. Mm-hmm. Um, and it works like, like, <laughs> like I got new clients from putting out videos. So like it works, um, but you have to do it. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's a big reason why like people hire us is like because they can come in to our studio, they can film for a day, and then they get their content, and like it's zero effort beyond that on their part. Like, and they just got to post it. So, yeah. definitely, that's a hundred percent. You said it. Like <laughs> you heard it here first, guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna start looking out for more of your videos, Denver. I totally expect. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> more coming up i'm i'm trying i'm trying it's just so much work so. it is it is it's important for people to know that it it does take a lot of work and effort um mm-hmm. but it makes sense but that's why they hire people like you or they go into the studio and and do it in one day and that's it it was an appointment they're done yeah and they have their content for you know that that amount of time. I'm curious before we dive into our quick fire, because I know that we're getting ready for that momentarily. Um, but Denver, what would you want clients to know or prospect clients who you know might be looking to work with you? What are some things you wish they knew before they got started to be the most prepped or ready or pumped up for that session? That's a tough one. I don't I I I, I don't know. I'm kind of stumped on that. Like, I don't. <laughs> Is there I don't, a pattern? Like, when they when they're there at their first session, they're like, "Oh, I didn't know we were gonna do this," or, or like they're or they get really excited about something in their first. Session. I w- I would say that like so. What we try to do is we try to offer like two options for people, like creating like fifteen videos in a half day or creating thirty in a full. Um, it's possible that you could make 30 in a half day, but that's kind of how, like how we try to break this up for many people after like a half day shoot and just like a half day of talking, they feel exhausted. So if there was anything I was going to prepare people for is like, if you don't want to discourage yourself and you've never done something like this before, it, it might be better for you to do a half day. Yeah. Cause it can be exhausting. I thought you were going to say caffeine. <laughs> that, that too. Coffee <laughs> is great. Yeah. <laughs> it was a uh, coffee day not too long ago. Well, by the time everybody's hearing this, it's long past. But um, <laughs> what is your preferred caffeinated beverage, Denver? How do you take your coffee? Oh, I, I, I make my coffee every morning. It is uh, it's like a maple coffee i don't know some maple infused coffee from duncan i don't i don't know uh and then i add uh it's like a caramel caramel syrup thing it's not syrup it's like a flavoring i don't know and then i add a uh, nut pods uh creamer 
I don't oh. know if you know what nut pods is. It's like an almond. It's like an almond creamer. It's good. So we'll put that in that piece of advice. Make sure that you yeah. <laughs> get that. Get that or coffee. Bring that. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I think it's time for a quick fire mail. Yeah. I mean, Are these just like 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 just like yes First or no questions? <laughs> okay. Could be right. thing that comes to mind. Yeah. <laughs> First thing that pops your head. All right. Uh, and some are like, I'll give you some options for some of them, but favorite film genre, action, romance, comedy, maybe comedy. Comedy. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Comedy. Okay, cool. Favorite onset snack. Like a protein bar. Yeah. 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 yeah like a protein bar. Yeah. All right. Keeping it healthy. That's good. No. Um, dream celebrity to work with. We actually have like a celebrity board, <laughs> like a dream Ooh. celebrity board in our, in our <laughs> office. Um, <clears throat> so, and it's not necessarily dream celebrity and like that this is like who like we desperately wanted to work with, but like who we thought could be reachable. We put Selena Gomez at the top of the list. Ooh. Um, the reason being was at the time when we were generating this list, she was putting out like a lot of content. So it just seemed like she could potentially be a, a super celebrity that we could make videos for. So we have, awesome. we have not pursued this at all, but Selena, <laughs> if you're watching, uh, you know. <laughs> we'll tag her. <laughs> several times. That's great. I wonder if we, we'll see. We'll see. What we'll happens. see. You never know. Yeah. Very important to know you're at the top. Okay. Right. I mean, there's there was other people at the bottom, so it was like, it was like a list of five celebrities. Um, editing software of choice. DaVinci Resolve. Oh, DaVinci Resolve. Yeah. Can I ask? I hear what's the feature that the what, that? what was the feature? Yeah. Why uh, did it? Initially, I switched over to Resolve. Mm, when was this maybe maybe five ish years ago and I, I switched over because at the time there was no m1 max and i'm a, I'm a very loyal apple user uh so prior to there being m1 max premiere did not like to function on the apple computers very well like it was slow um so I switched to DaVinci because it was optimized for the max. And then I've never looked back. I love it. That's it's awesome. a, re it's a requirement to work here that like, you, <laughs> you know, DaVinci resolve. We haven't quite made it a required, but we're Mac people ourselves. So it's like, we, we really try and do Mac iPhone, Pierre, the Android, like can't be part of the group chat, you know, it's exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, favorite filming location. Is this like a dream filming location or sure. Let's go for Okay, yeah. cuz if I could if a, a dream filming location would be Wormslow in Savannah, Georgia. Have you heard of this? Oh, yes, I have. I know Savannah. Okay. So, yeah. I've not been so there. Like, Wormslow is like this it, it's like an old plantation site, but that's not why it's cool. There's there's like a a road that goes towards the plantation and it's like a grass gravel kind of road. And there's Oak trees on either side, lining the entire road for like, as far as you can see. And they like overhang and like Spanish moss is like dangling from the, the trees. It's a beautiful site. And so like, if I could film anywhere, I'd film there for something. I don't know what it would be, but that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca actually got married in Savannah a year oh, okay. and a half ago, and uh, that was my favorite thing. Actually, seeing the Spanish moss from there, I'm like, what is that? I didn't know what it was called. I, I had never really focused in on it before, but there was so much of it, and mm -hmm. it really just makes the road so beautiful. So I'm gonna have to look up that location. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Worm Slow. It's it's worm a slow beautiful place best film director of all time yeah. <laughs> who i'm the biggest fan of i think mm -hmm. is robert rodriguez um okay. i don't know that he's the best film director of all time but i really like robert rodriguez and kevin smith and 
uh yeah I, I but robert rodriguez especially i just like that like his kind of like you know nothing to something kind of like trajectory and uh i really like that he's reinvented himself multiple times throughout his career like he started in like this indie cinema you know like uh I, I don't even know like the proper word for it. Like his first films in like Spanish, but then the next one's like not in Spanish, but then it's still <laughs> very like uh, kind of still in that same type of like world, I guess. Yeah. I don't know what you would call it. Like it's like Texas, but like Mexico partly. I don't know. It's, it's, it feels like a very Robert Rodriguez genre. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes into like, uh, children's movies, family movies with like spy kids. Um, so, and then I like that he went away from that and now he's coming back. Like he just did a new spy kids movie. I'm not here to promote his movie, but he's pretty good. <laughs> That's funny. Cool. I'm like, now that you're saying spy kids, I'm like, okay, now I'm trying to figure out what the other movies are. So I'll probably. So like, uh, he did, uh, machete, um, grindhouse, I think he did Sin City. Um, uh, El Mariachi like, yeah. was the first like one, but like, it's like it's it's, it's an interesting trajectory. I really I, I like it. So, yeah, that is cool. That's awesome. Uh, camera gear you can't live without. Ooh, wow! It's got one or two. It can't be like. Seven pieces of equipment. <laughs> just one or like, two. Well, I mean, that's that's a tough one because, <laughs> like, so like we use we use red Komodos here, and they're made up of like tons of different accessories. So they're not like even like if you just had that, it's not. You know what? I'm it, I'm. It's my iPhone. I can't live ah. with. I can't live without my iPhone. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the one. So, that's so funny. Yeah. I was gonna say like I'm not a videographer or professional at all, but I would have to say my iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so yep. glad you said that. <laughs> 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 all right, let's give us some behind the scenes for our last two questions. So, um, early morning shoots or late night edits? What's your preference? Oh, I'm I'm all about like getting things done in the morning, like. Oh. Uh, yeah, I am running a business like you have to like set like the rules, I guess. And yeah. like I'm very much about the work life balance and like like I want I want things even like shoots to happen between nine and five. Like mm -hmm. we used to do a lot of like seven to seven, but like now I'm like nine to five. Like there's there's just almost no reason for any production to last longer than that. And if it does, like you're not, you're not optimizing things. Golden moment. Uh, the first time that you did tell us the first time that you held a camera. Um, but was that bigger or was it the first time that you saw your work on either the big screen or like going viral? So what was, I guess, more pivotal? You know, it's, I, I think it's the, if I look back, you know, like the first time people like, like when I was in college, we had like a college, like film showcase or whatever, like where you showed your student films and like having like something I made play back in front of like an audience and then like seeing their reactions was, was really great. Um, but now, uh, now seeing comments and stuff is it's almost just as rewarding. Mm. Uh, a few months ago, we made, we made a piece for T-Mobile and I actually, I directed and I acted in it. Ooh. Um, and it has become like a Reddit thing. <laughs> And so, I mean, like, even like this morning, I was looking just to see like what people were saying on Reddit about it. And it's all hate. It's no, there's nothing positive. Everything is negative. But like, 
the fact that like there are so many people out there that hate this video so much <laughs> is like like it's it, it's just appealing to me i don't i don't know why i find it so entertaining but <laughs> I don't, I also don't know why they hate it that much, but they do. It's online. Like they can make the comments that they want. People that enjoyed it usually just enjoy it. And exactly. then they move on. You know, people that hate just, they hate. <laughs> right. It is. <laughs> right. You hate it though. You must be doing something right if you have haters. So it's a good thing in yes. a way. Yeah. Yes. Well, those are all my questions. Uh, you did great. You did great, Denver. <laughs> like, I'm going to throw stuff at you. You have to choose. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. But we're so excited. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. So where can people find you and your company online? You're on Instagram, TikTok. Where can people find you? Yeah, I'm, I'm at Denver Bailey everywhere. Beautiful. And then the company is at Enjoy New Media everywhere so even url enjoynewmedia.com everywhere awesome yeah. and if you're listening on a uh, podcast if you're on youtube we'll have those linked in the description of the podcast so people can find you super easily um, but thank you so much for tuning in to the bite Size podcast for strategy and snack size with Denver Daily today we appreciate that